Some people are drawn to honeybees because they seek a deeper connection. Maybe honeybees and being near them can bring a broader awareness and a sense of place in the natural world. Honeybees are ancient. Are they also a possible source of healing? I'm Frederick Dunn, and today my guest is Sarah Mapelli. Sarah is a bee dancer. She appeared on the cover of the film Queen of the Sun, an award-winning documentary. What are the bees telling us? This is The Way to Be, and here's Sarah. Hi, my name is uh, Sarah Tink Mapelli. I go by Tink often, and I dance with honeybees. And I've been dancing with honeybees since 2001. I live in the Columbia River Gorge in Washington, and I live part-time in Mexico, in Guanajuato, Mexico, where I help run a retreat center. Okay, well, thank, thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. This is a very, very interesting topic. And uh, it's not something that I think people know much about. So this is going to be very revelatory for some of the viewers who are a lot of backyard beekeepers. Uh, but I know that a lot of people feel when they're in the presence of bees, that there is also something beyond the bee itself going on. And that's why I reached out to you. And I guess my first question for you is, uh, you are a beekeeper, aside from doing these um, circle dances and things like that. Yeah. So when did your beekeeping begin? Um, pretty much sort of afterwards, I would, I would say, in a way. I had a hive, but um, someone gave me a hive. When I got home, the hive had died. I didn't even know when we had loaded it into the car, it was already dead. And so then we sort of started from there. Well, let's start beekeeping. We have everything. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I started dancing with bees from having a vision. And I was driving down uh, Highway 14 and I saw myself covered in bees standing in a pristine cul-de-sac of houses. And at that point I was working on a large uh, scale public, not public, but puzzle project where I was making like one uh, 6,000 piece puzzles and working with a puzzle company and doing collage. And um, so I, it took me about three months to find somebody to work with and create the vision. And the idea about the piece was how do, how, how do we communicate with each other and how do we work with each other as a whole in comparison to the greed of the individual mm -hmm. and the, um, the keeping to oneself. So mm -hmm. being in this pristine cul-de-sac of everybody has their own blender and there's not a communal space and people don't know their neighbors closely. It was um, a reflection upon that. Mm -hmm. So that's how it began. So can you let, can we back up a little bit? You had a vision. So when does that come to you? Like when you're half asleep? Uh, oh, I was just driving and then I saw it. It's, it's like a painting in my head. And right? can I ask you, does, has that happened throughout your life or was that new to you? No. Yeah. That's just, that's normal for me. So then you've learned maybe that when you have a vision or something like that, that you should act upon it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like a roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then so you saw the bees, but you had no previous experience with bees, and you thought that you're supposed to have bees all over you. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 that, it made perfect sense to me. Well, and that's, but that's very bold because even people that are brand new beekeepers, uh, their first thought is, how do I keep from getting stung? And they want to cover themselves and every piece of protective equipment that's available. And, uh, but you didn't have any of those fears. No, in fact, I don't think I had ever been stung. So um, I remember saying to the professor I was working with, as the bees were landing, I was like, wow, I don't think I've ever been stung before. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, okay. Um, and, you know, I had the bees on the very first time for over two hours. And he said, well, um, this is the longest I've ever been around anybody because he used to do bee beards during right. his, his thing as sort of a, you know, during his, the end of the year class on bees. Yeah. Um, yeah, he said, like, well, I've never been anyone covered in that many bees for so long. And I was like, oh, I'm not done. It was, it just put me into such a, a beautiful meditative space. 
Mm -hmm. And since um, I was 18, I've been an energy healer and that's the work I do on the side uh, or in parallel. I mean, I feel like I'm about seven different people. Um, and, and the sensation was so much the same as when I'm working on somebody's body and helping mm -hmm. them clear energy pathways. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a completely familiar place for me to um, access. Mm -hmm. So you started as an energy healer at 18. And then how old were you when the B vision came? Um, I think 32-ish. Oh, wow. So quite a time frame. So, yeah. was, uh, so a healer, is that how you, so holistic medicine yeah. and healing, is that uh, what you had been doing for a living from 18 on? Um, that and freelancing art, public art. Um, and also on the side, uh, building my own house out of uh, recycled materials. A recycled house, that's a whole new category right there. That's right. Um, <laughs> and, and lots of uh, straw bale building and teaching alternative. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with the straw bale uh, yeah. construction, especially in the desert Southwest. Um, mm -hmm. But so they call that upcycling when you're recycling and building a house from that. So. Now I think that's the new term, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. See, this is much farther in a lot of different directions than I anticipated. So, and you're right. A lot of uh, beekeepers, especially at the end of classes, or there's the honey queen and things like that. They like to put the queen bee in a cage, put it uh, under someone's chin. And then of course the bees create this bee beard. We see that everywhere. Right. Uh, what we don't see, and I happen to have the video right here, Woo! is the Queen okay, of the that's, Sun. That's such a good movie. It's I a great it. movie. Everyone. Yeah, it's a great movie. And I've actually referenced this a lot as I've talked to people about bees, because I like to tell people, look at her upper lip <laughs> as it progresses. Her lip is swelling up. We see you now. We know that your lips are perfectly normal. And uh, but you had committed to, you know, you've got the bees on as your garment, right. and your lip is swelling up. So there's, it's a point of no return. So you kind of right. have to, does that, was that a rare thing that happened to get? It something? was, it was totally, um, you know, we had this vision. I sat down with Taggart, uh, the, <clears throat> the film creator, and, um, and we said, wouldn't it be amazing if you were laying in the field and then you got up and you were covered in bees? And so that's how we started that video is I laid down and when we put the bees down, one girl just like, she just landed with her butt right in my face. And I was like, well, that's, well, that's that. And, you know, I just had, I just kept going. I didn't land a choice. Mm -hmm. um, so normally, yeah, that never, that's not, that's not normal <laughs> at all. If now, you know, or just in general, I usually, if anything gets stung maybe twice, mm -hmm. two, to, two to four times. Mm -hmm. And that's only if they get tangled up. I don't wear anything on my torso so they don't get stuck, but sometimes right. they get stuck. I have had one last time fly up my pant leg, even though I try to keep the pant leg um, tight enough Mm -hmm. and got stuck behind my knee but um yeah every time I learn something new yeah the other <laughs> the other part of that is I noticed that you keep your arms extended it's very important because now what if you if you closed <laughs> your arm you've got yeah and you you can't see you were wearing nothing you were wearing the bees yeah um, I got my bee blouse the bee blouse have other people reached out to you about how to do that or did you did you find that some people wanted that experience themselves rather than just the healing circles that you do a couple people yeah okay so what's your answer to them um i don't really have it i mean i'm just i don't like i don't want to take my time to do that like there's so much to do in my life like that's not that's not my um that's right. not my passion or path is to train people or whatever you would want to say. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's no, not, com it not comfortable. You know, yeah, people I say, ooh, does that tickle? I'm like, no, it, it's really not. It's painful because the bottom layer are biting to hold on. Well, and yeah. It's sometimes eight inches thick, right? Mm -hmm. In part as they move. And it's itchy and um, you sweat a lot. 
Um, but you know, for me, um, that's that's part of the transcendence of it in a way, because um, for me, it became right away. It was very clear that it was a duet. They're pushing. I'm pulling. I'm moving. I'm listening to them. Oh, we're going this way. Oh, we're going that way. Oh, let's stand still and soak up the sun. Mm -hmm. Like it's very clear, but I I hear them. Let's mm -hmm. oh, let's go to the right. Okay, let's move this way. Mm -hmm. You know, and so in that communication, I started to integrate my energy work in the the ring. So mm -hmm. at first, when I first did the um, healing ring, I said, you know, come with an intention and let me know beforehand. So each person that I interacted with, I knew what they wanted to work on. Some mm -hmm. people were like, you know, I've had a chronic hip problem mm -hmm. or I, I, I'm afraid of nature. You know, those are my favorites. Like here's nature right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Here's a moment where people, their faces are scared. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, and then they melt into like, oh, I get it. Aha, mm -hmm. we're all together, mm -hmm. you know? And that's my message. Like, okay, see how we're all together. See the magic. Mm -hmm. See how we have separated ourselves from nature because we feared it for so long. Mm -hmm. you know? And where, where does that happen mostly? Is that down in Mexico or equally here in the United um, States? In Oregon, yeah. In Oregon? Yeah. I'd love to do one in Mexico and I have enough beekeepers here that I could work with. Um, it just hasn't happened yet, but mm -hmm. I would love to do that in Mexico. And we're for anybody watching or listening, we're going to put links to your website and of course your YouTube, which also shows some of the videos so people can get a visual of what we're talking sure. about here. Yeah. And um, so how do the people find out about you uh, that makes them want to join a healing circle? Um, the best way is to send me a note on the contact sheet. It's under Buzz Me mm -hmm. on my uh, website. And then I'll put you on my newsletter which I don't send out very many because I don't like to bombard people. Mm -hmm. That newsletter also covers our retreats that happen in Mexico and um, any upcoming art shows that we do. We have a, a gallery in the Columbia Gorge too. So, Describe the art show. What, uh, oh, what so, art? so we have, we have a gallery in our, on our space. So we have rotating art shows that are, are mostly, um, paintings um and um that's a lot of my partner's work at the moment and then i've been doing a lot of work in vr so doing a lot of virtual reality um painting and uh creating installations and your partner is theodore yeah and um an artist also yeah he's a painter and he's also my bee wrangler so he he helps me get the bees on and off, and he's my my gentle soul. No, I do I do have a question about so like when you're doing a healing circle, and if you're making a a video about it, do you find that if there's electronic equipment and things like that around, does that have an impact on the energy that you feel when you're doing that? I haven't noticed that. You know, I have people singing for me or playing mm -hmm. music. And, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, the first times I. Um, I danced with bees. I didn't have any sound. And then I talked to the professor I worked with. I said, what, what about music? He's like, bring on the music. I mean, it's just another frequency. And, and um, I really noticed that the sound of the bees seemed to change with the tone of the music, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, the last dance we incorporated, well, the, the, the first time we incorporated music, we had only raga. Indian raga. So we had the tambour and the tabla. Mm -hmm. And those sounds are really droney sounds. And um, last time we had an introduction and we, 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 we came in with guitar and accordion and mm -hmm. um, drum. And it was a totally different, like the feeling was more upbeat mm -hmm. and a little bit lighter. And then when we went into the circle, the raga took over and then it became more like um settling and grounded mm -hmm. so i i'm actually interested in 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 incorporating some more like 
uh, looping sounds and and just seeing what happens with looping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you find that percussion instruments um, are more desirable? Um, I don't know. No, I think it's just because you can feel that when there's any kind of tom tom yeah. or drum or yeah right i mean you know there is that that way of bringing the hive into a hollow space by drumming on mm -hmm. a hive so and does the, the time of day matter oh yeah it needs to be actually uh warm you know it has to be above 72 or 75 mm -hmm. outside uh no but wind late afternoon midday uh, we usually we usually start around one okay. and it's usually a two hour dance time. Okay. Yeah. And I spent, I really like it, you know, really spend time with each person. And, mm -hmm. um, the last one we did, um, we had everyone bring a dish of food mm -hmm. and that was, you know, pollinated by bees. And then everybody ate together. We made one long table and mm -hmm. everyone ate a big meal and got to know each other. And then they came to the circle. And that for me was so beautiful to have, like the gathering of people beforehand. And then people weren't like distracted because they were hungry or something or thirsty. Mm -hmm. And um, it really made the space so, so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know? And I, and I think you made a film about that, right? You began, you sat at the head of the table. It looks like yeah. almost a tea party. Oh, yeah. That was, that was actually in the Queen of the Sun. But Afterwards, I did go out after at the end, we sat down together and had a little bit of tea and and um, next time we're going to set that up to to have more of a, a formal sitting together and eating with the bees. It's probably better they're not there during a whole meal because they get really excited and they're like, oh, there's some something right. We yeah. Buy, you know, yeah. And so I guess probably. Another practical question would be at the end of the ceremony, how are you getting the bees off? You'll probably remove the queen cage and, and yeah, then what I'm happens? I'm sure that she has lots of daughters with her. She's not by mm -hmm. herself in there. Um, yeah, and then we take her back to the hive and then like kind of jump, like if you were like dumping a swarm back, back into a, you know. Okay. A box, just like that. And then I end up, um, I just stay there until nighttime by the hive until everybody gets in and then close so yeah so you just sit there and wait for them to find their way back yeah i just put down the blanket and have a nap that's funny actually have you ever had like a rainstorm come in or something oh, happen so our last dance it started to it poured on the way there i was so i was just so nervous because it you know i'm the, i'm really the one who's like ordering the porta potties and the doing everything and advertising and making sure that people are getting their own time and directions. And it takes me about three months to organize it by myself. So um, I was really worried, you know, and had like uh, I had seven musicians with all their instruments and, and um, one of the musicians came in, he's like, it's gonna be just fine. And I said, okay, well, let's switch it around and we'll have the, the meal first and then we'll, and as people ate, the sun came out and the sky opened up and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful day. So. And that, and makes, eating, that makes a very dramatic setting when you have the clouds and the sun comes through. That's a great, you talk about visual arts. That would be a yes. great opportunity. It was, it was. And we got a great, um, uh, somebody had a drone and they went way up high and we got the, the, a picture of just the big white circle because I asked everyone to dress in white. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another thing I noticed too, is that they did dress in white. Yeah. Um, so I guess my next question is, how many people do you allow to compose a circle? Is there a limit? Are we trying to keep it small? Because you have to address each person in the circle. Right. So what are your limits? I think the last time was perfect. It was about 88 people. That's a lot. Time. Wow. It was a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of energy to hold. You know, I definitely uh, took the whole next day and stayed in bed and watched movies. <laughs> and yeah. just slept. But um, to me, it is like the most, it's a place of service. You know, mm. I, I, it's just like, how can I give you something to, to realize that we, we need to up our game on 
on how we interact with the world mm-hmm. and how we create magic and how we find magic and how we can express magic. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, gonna give you, to- I'm gonna give you a hard question. Okay. What, what's magic? What's magic? <laughs> well, it's sort of the unseen revealed, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it, even if it's just a glimpse of, of that, that spark that you feel and you're in, inspired, mm-hmm. you know, and, then, and, and something that changes your point of view forever. I mean, I still have people who come up to me and say, I'm changed. Mm-hmm. Or I stopped drinking that day and I haven't drank since. Mm-hmm. You know, big things. That's very interesting. Yeah. And in your screening process, I mean, what if you get somebody that's just negative? Uh, they're, I mean. I haven't had that experience yet. Maybe because they changed their mind. <laughs> okay. So you would accept someone that had a healthy skepticism about what a healing circle is and sure. how the keys might play a part. Yeah, I, I, I am a, a skeptic myself. You know, I think it's important to be completely, um, you know, checking that out. Oh, is that too woo or whatever? You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've been doing energy work for so long. I always have to rem- remind myself, trust, trust what's happening and not question it because you might miss something. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, another thing that, that is really fabulous is when people write me notes afterwards, like uh, my favorite one was somebody said, you know, I never really thought about the bees when I w- would go mow my lawn. Mm-hmm. And, and the next day afterwards, I went outside and I said aloud, okay, everyone, I'm gonna mow my lawn. So, um, please move and then I'll mow and then you can come back you know and she was like I was aware every time who's flying in and how am I you know interacting with my lawn and mm-hmm. I thought oh I just did my job if you if one person wants to go out and be careful out there mowing their lawn I wish more people would think that way when they look at their lawn and they see the bees all over their clover that that's not the time to be running your mower across your yard. So. Or please take up your lawn and plant flowers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm all about that. Yeah. So the other thing is this feedback that you get from people. Can you share a couple of you know really poignant stories that someone who went to a healing circle that you did and they told you or shared something with you about what happened to them, some transformation that occurred? Um share a couple stories about people that had a really, really deep experience. Let's see. Um, well, I, I was just looking at, you know, like um, somebody, I can't think of anything specific at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, those were the ones I was thinking about. Um, I think especially the person who stopped drinking. I mean, that, that was huge. I didn't even know that that was something that they were, they were, working on in their world. Um, sometimes a sentence comes up to me. I remember a sentence like very poignant and I try to remember those so I can tell them to people. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, I think one was like, uh, well, I had this, this one person that uh, she was sitting there and I just all of a sudden felt like I had swords coming out and I just started cutting. And I told her afterwards and she said, I was sitting there the whole time thinking, where is my warrior self? You know, and that's, hmm. that's what was, I was feeling from her. It's like, okay, here are your swords. I present you your sword, you know? So it's, it's, it's kind of a visual thing that happens mm-hmm. in, in front of somebody for me. Mm-hmm. And then I just, I kind of feel like we're mirroring we get to marry each other. Mm-hmm. And you know, you have like 15,000 uh, sets of eyes, five eyes at a time. So whatever that is, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> multiplied, mm. you know, seeing you. So when you say, all right, these eyes, do you know what a morphic loop is? No, tell me. Where, where you see through animals? Oh, okay, okay. But that's not that's not what you're describing. Like you don't begin to have visions based on what the bees are seeing. No, but I just I have this idea. Like, can you imagine 
if you're being viewed by five sets of eyes times 15,000, mm-hmm. how, in, how incredible that is. Mm-hmm. You That's know. actually, you're, you're describing a good piece of art for somebody right there. <laughs> the, you know, rather than, because a lot of people like to tie in science with experiences like this and say, this is what a bee would see. So you see this heavily pixelated view of a flower, for example, right. but no one's translated that into what does a swarm of bees see collectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so yeah. that's, you talk about visions, that's what's. Well, it's, that's it's, what's <laughs> I think about it a lot. I think about it. Yeah. I think like, what does that person look like? Mm-hmm. And what is the communication that you can't see really happening? Mm-hmm. So there's a saying that uh, people say, tell it to the bees. So for those who think there, there's no spiritual aspect to honeybees, uh, there's a connection when a beekeeper passes that somebody is supposed to go and sit next to their hives and tell it to the bees. Mm-hmm. What's your, do you have an interpretation of why they I, do that? Or I think that is the most beautiful thing ever. Mm-hmm. You know, can you imagine how, I think that is just so, um, well, I think it's so respectful. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. people love their bees. Well, they do. And I think often they don't really, I think a lot of people through pride uh, won't admit that they sit near bees and have a deeper experience. Mm -hmm. I think that they don't want to be laughed at. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there is something that happens to people when they they get near a colony of bees and they, most bee yards uh, that are backyard beekeepers, there's comfortable chairs and benches all over the apiary. Right. And the reason is because there's great comfort in sitting in the presence of honeybees. And I had a, I had a loose theory about that, that um, uh, if you look into Native Americans and the way they view land and the way they view the energies of the earth and everything else, um, because I have the books on, you know, the secret life of trees and things like that as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, so my uh, thoughts are that when you plant um, trees and flowers and things that have a scent to them, it attracts ancestors. This is a Native American view of it. Mm-hmm. Therefore, to honor your ancestors, you plant things because they can't eat anymore. Right. They can't taste things, but they smell. Right. So my question was, uh, and maybe you've had some experience or knew something about it, maybe things are attracted just like people are to these bee yards or where the bees are housed or hived. And so maybe something else is there also that extends that deeper feeling and brings them that comfort. So they might be getting some kind of reward for bringing the bees there in the first place and engaging nature through that hive. What do you think about that? I I totally agree. And I think it's also the sound, you know, Mm -hmm. it's interesting to me because of the ohm you know, that's, used. oh, yeah. And, and I think that the ohm and the hum are like the sound of the universe. You know, that sound is so loud. And um, I, I really asked, I ask that the um, musicians stop every once in a while so people can hear the bees, you know, um, because that sound is, is to me the sound of silence, you know. Is silence that you think si- silence is a very loud sound? Yeah, yeah. Do you, yeah, deafening silence. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that that's what's meant by the song of increase? That book is that? I don't know. The, I, I don't know. You'll have to ask Jacqueline. Of, okay. <laughs> she is wonderful. You're going to really enjoy speaking with her. Well, if she agrees to speak with me, I certainly am going to reach out to them because I want to know more about this. And uh, I think that people do begin uh, beekeeping for one reason and often continue beekeeping for another. Yes. Um, So so for you, you began just because you had this vision, but now you continue with that. So beyond the healing circles, what's your interaction with honeybees? What are you doing? Well, in the last couple of years, we, we uh, stopped having bees in the gorge because the road crew, crew sprayed and all of our hives died. So we're taking a little break 
we have we have everything set up and uh we're you know last year i tried to get on the swarm list but i think covid just really <laughs> everything got difficult and so um <clears throat> Yeah, it's a, it, it's a hard situation to be in. Like, do you continue to have bees and then every few years you are fighting against the city or, you know, the county coming by with their, their trucks? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've called and, and they don't do anything about it. So um, I, I'm all set up and ready and we have a whole new garden happening. So so we, we want to get bees back and, mm -hmm. and hopefully, um, will be lucky that they they won't come by because it seems to be like an every few year kind of thing or like maybe it misses them but you know it only takes 12 bees to get covered in in spray to mm -hmm. pass it through a hive in like 48 mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. and i watched it happen and it was so it was so sad mm -hmm. that um so we've we have taken the break for the last few years and um Last summer we reset up everything and like okay let's let's try it again, but it's also like do we try it again? So we're kind mm -hmm. of in a. In a oh, so when's the last way. when's the last time you did a honeybee dance? Um, twenty eighteen. I was oh. planning on doing one in Italy. Um, in twenty nineteen, and we went and uh, scouted the place out, and then we were going to do the dance in twenty twenty, but because of COVID, it hasn't happened. So I'm trying to decide whether or not I'm going to do one this summer or mm -hmm. um, next summer. So right. what part? What part of Italy? Um, Torino. Okay, I know Torino. Yeah, yeah okay. it's great. I so, used to live. I used to live in Gaeta. Okay, okay. I don't know <laughs> where that is, but I I love Torino. It's amazing, and I had a friend there, and she um she. I actually met on Facebook and she took me to a beekeeper's home. And then I realized that he looked, he said, Hey, I'm also in queen of the sun. And I just didn't know. And so we connected that way. And um, so we were planning to do a, uh, a dance at his big apiary there. But um, you know, since COVID everything kind of fell apart and yeah. kind of like, I'm not sure if I, I should, have a dance this year or not i'm mm -hmm. i'm torn because i don't want to put a lot of time to make something happen and then nobody can come or a new variant shows up or and when you when you look at a map of italy where's torino where's torino it's we're uh, looking north. at got the boot is it up here on the it's northern yeah, right north. yeah yeah and it's on the adriatic right um i well i don't know I, it's in the uh Pyrenees. What is that? Uh, the mountains. Yeah, it's it's yeah. yeah, it's really beautiful. So is it near Livorno at all? No, it's closer to Genoa. Okay. Like uh, Tuscany, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Gaeta is on the west coast, right between Rome and Naples, equidistant. Okay. Old castle there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were actually looking at doing a bee dance in the old castle ruin. It's basically just walls and then a huge uh, grassy knoll space. Yeah, yeah. And there are ruins all over. It's amazing to me what's there. We would we would turn into a park or something and, right. and protect it from the public. But I used to actually go and sit in an old Roman general's villa. And, uh, of course, the roof is gone, but there was the staircase, and it was all grown over, like you're describing. Yeah, and, uh, I couldn't get permission from the the. Um, I don't know if it's the governor or the. I couldn't get permission to do it. Okay, there, but we tried. Well, things may have changed. I was there in the '80s, early '80s. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, well, okay. So my next question. My places. Pardon. I said Italy is one of my most favorite places. Is it, you have any plans to? get a home there or move there? <laughs> no, but I'd like to just stay there for a, a couple months and uh, bring my art supplies and you know, work on something. Oh, that's funny because I was trying to become a painter when I was in Italy and I was the worst painter on earth. But uh, so I gave up. I tried to paint the way you would draw, which was totally wrong. Right. Uh, and, I, well, and I had nobody, yeah. I think, um, I think, 
art isn't about being good. Art is about having the experience for yourself. Well, you can say that, and then you have these opinionated friends. And so if you care about what your friends think, I guess that's your ruin right there. You shouldn't care and you should just continue to express yourself and follow your path and all that. I love that. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they, they came out with a new invention called the, the VCR. Uh-huh. And uh, that's when I watched public television. There was a guy named uh, Bill Alexander. Okay. The happy painter. Have you heard of him? No. That's I when I finally Ross. pardon. I know Bob Ross. Well, Bob Ross was a student of Bill Alexander's. So Bill okay. Alexander was before Bob. Okay. And uh, he did that wet on wet technique. And my mother, who was a psycholinguist, uh, had sent me an oil painting set. And I just shelved it because I wasn't doing very well. But then I was in a store one day and I saw how expensive those oils were. I thought I should do something with that. So I did that wet on wet stuff. And then that launched me into really painting. That was a foundation. And then I just went on. So it was good, but I want to move on to another topic. Okay. Um, the Queen of the Sun video that we showed at the beginning, how did they find you and how did they um, work it out where you would be the opening sequence of that? Uh... I, um, let's see, a friend of mine knew Taggart and she introduced us. And uh, Taggart was so excited. He went out and bought a brand new camera. And he said, I, I got my camera, when can we, when can we shoot the first scene? Um, and I and we arranged the date, and it was the very first thing he even shot for the movie. So it became oh. the opening scene. And, and and then he traveled all over the world, um, interviewing people, mostly Europe and Australia. He sure and, did. He sure yeah. did. And he yeah. really put together a list of beekeepers that were managing bees on a deeper level. So fabulous. So. Um, and then have you seen his the the following movie to that, which is Seed, S-E-E-D, about seeds? No. And I opened that movie as well. Um, and I laid in a bed for 72 hours while my dress grew uh, arugula. And I didn't move out of the bed the whole time. It was uh, a stop animation. So I would move every few seconds and I had three cameras on me shooting. Every minute they would go off. And then people would come and feed me. What? I, why don't so I know about this? Movie. Why don't I know about this film? It's on, it's on DVD also? Yeah. And it's, you can find it through uh, Collectivi, which is his uh, website. I think it must be collectivi.com. Well, what I'll do is I'll ask you to send me links that are yeah, relevant to the things we've talked about today, and they will be down in the video description. Yeah. And for those who listen to this on podcast, it will also be in the podcast description so people can find out more. Yeah, it's a great movie. It's all about uh, seed, seed banks, and the loss of seed. Yeah, and we really have. Um, it's striking uh, yeah, how I many cried. species. I cried through that movie. <laughs> Pardon? I cried. I cried through the movie. When I yeah, saw because it. a lot of what we've lost is not recoverable. Right. And people don't realize uh, just the diversity, even in tomatoes, just for example, that 100 years ago, we had all these different choices. And today, I think we have like 5%. Right. It's something it's of, yeah. Pretty amazing. Pretty devastating. Yeah. Yeah. That's a whole topic on its own. Yeah. And, and Taggart would be an amazing person to interview. And I could uh, connect you if you're interested. I would be interested. Yeah. So let me see what else I wrote down here. Oh yeah, when you're uh, looking at bees and dealing with bees, do you get the impression that you're dealing with something that is timeless and ancient? Yes, absolutely. And that I mean, will- I guess it, if you like, the bees are represented in Egyptian tombs and exactly. they honey in Egypt yeah. in, in tombs, you know, it's, it's endless. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, one, one, at one time I wanted to have, you know, do a bee dance in different countries. And then at that same time, have someone who was with me who would collect the stories from the beekeepers and then recipes and, and mm -hmm. you know, medicinal uh, attributes for each country. That was one of mm -hmm. my big plans. Yeah. And maybe it will happen, but I thought it would be really beautiful to 
integrate that with each beekeeper that mm -hmm. I got the chance to dance with their bees. What country would be at the top of your list for those who are most compatible with your view of the bees? Oh, most compatible. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I think Italy is my first, was my first hope um, mm -hmm. because my, my father's side is Italian and I thought okay. it'd be just great to go there. Um, I, I think it would be amazing to do one in India or mm -hmm. Israel. I, I, there's one beekeeper I, I, I communicate with um, on Facebook and I think, oh, I'd love to go and, and do a bee oh, dance with her. You're in communication with somebody in Israel? Yeah. Is uh, that beekeeper part of a kibbutz? Um, I don't think so, no, but she has a, she just is always posting. She's like a master swarm catcher. She's just catching okay. swarms all the time. And um, I don't know, Some I just have this vision that someday I would get to chase yeah. her. And, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. But of course I went to a kibbutz and visited a chicken, the guy that was responsible for raising chickens for that community. Oh, neat. And that sounds great. Well, yeah, um, that would be, that would be fabulous. So let me see if there's anything else I have not. You talk about the hive mind. Mm -hmm. Do, would you be able to elaborate on what the hive mind is? Well, I think since everybody gets a chance to do each job, they all know the responsibilities of that job. Mm -hmm. uh, what if we all did that as a society? You know, what if everybody knew what it was like to be the plumber or the electrician and everybody knew what it was like to be a congressperson. Can you imagine how much more balanced we would be? Mm -hmm. I think that that's that's the that's the beauty of the hive mind that we don't, you know, um, get to experience. We we could experience it through thinking, like, mm -hmm. but not through actuality. Mm -hmm. So I think I think because that they all work together and it's all about creating homeostasis. Mm -hmm. How do we create balance and togetherness? Mm -hmm. and that's what we're really lacking, you know, I mean. Yeah, all <laughs> orchestrated to guarantee the perpetuation of the species. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Right, <laughs> but, so, but, yeah. I think, but in a healthy way. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where we think we're doing that, but we're doing it in, in a destructive way, mm -hmm. you know, our our planetary uh, brain needs to um, <laughs> let's work together right now, and this is the time, and this yeah. is the hope. Yeah. And so many of us here want that. I don't understand why why the the few in power get to choose, mm -hmm. hope, you know, to go on the sort of. The, you you would think it would be an easy philosophy to convince people of that you want to guarantee health, well-being, and survival of the species because now the species is us. So, right, right. Uh, you would think that would be an easy sell, but apparently it's I, not. I don't understand <laughs> it. It's, yeah. it's hitting yourself yeah. on the wall. Yeah. So the other thing is you said that understanding on a cellular level. Yes. Um, so when I have the bees on me, I, I, the very first time thought, looked at, I was like, this is what my body looks like if it was expanded and I could see all my cells moving. Mm -hmm. And I, I slowly put my hand in the hive, bring it out. And I'm like, this is what it would be like if I could put myself in my body, if I could put my hand through my body. Mm -hmm. Like so that that room. super yeah the super organism yes view yeah and how much room and how much space and breath is between each cell is between mm -hmm. each bee mm -hmm. and that's actually that's physics i mean when you touch a person on the arm you never touch them right there is always space around the cells the molecules and everything else and that view if you can really think of everything around you in that way it's all energy it's all actually in motion yeah, yeah. so as a child yeah. i always i was always apologizing to any um object if i slapped it or something because i felt like oh i'm sorry i just moved you around 
<laughs> I was really aware of that as a child. And I grew up on 11 acres as an only child. I spent most of my time in the woods, in the trees. So, so that's, that's part of my aspect already. So were you solitary? Yeah, I, I just had, it was me and my cat. Yeah. And the goats and... <laughs> So you would you would go outside and just be an observer? Oh yeah, that that my job was I was the ferry architect. I would go and check out if somebody needed a bridge fixed, then I would fix the the architecture of the steps yeah. so all the ferries could get to, you know, the other side of the log. <laughs> that was my okay. Job. So all right, now this is getting interesting. So your parents, what were your parents like? Uh, my mom, my mom raised me and she uh, was an artist. So she was okay. always working in the studio. Okay. And so, you know, if we weren't doing an art project together, then I was in the woods. Okay. So she was a single parent. Yeah. Now, when you said you went out there and you fixed little fairy bridges and things like that, did you have a sense that there were living things in the woods oh, yeah. that you, that you could not see? Yeah. So are you a fan of like Brian Froud and people like that who have? The fairy book? Is that the fairy book? Yeah, good fairies, bad fairies. I uh, love that book. <laughs> well, because he's a great artist. His wife yeah, is a great artist. Fabulous. Um, and, but he's not joking when he um, talks about. Oh, I, I absolutely, I have seen the yeah. fairy. Yeah, see, so yeah, that's yeah, interesting too. And at what age did that first happen to you? Oh, um, I must have been four or five. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you just... Oh, when I first saw the fairy? Yeah. Oh, no, I was 20. Oh, you're kidding. When I saw, when I was like, that is a real fairy. Oh, that's past the age. I thought you had to see him by 12 or something. No, so I knew would, they were Because in reality, we were yeah, reality... Talking. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. Go ahead. No, I said we were always talking, you know in the woods i mean they, you weren't you're not alone in the woods yeah that is really interesting because i don't think once again i think people get older and uh refuse to revisit childhood uh experiences like that because rationally you've been told that that probably didn't happen yeah so i don't just, believe in that stuff you have a great imagination <laughs> you know? i believe that you 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 constant have the opportunity to have magical things happen to you and that's mm -hmm. sad if you only think that only happens as a child but it's, right that's, that's sad and the other thing is the more you react and respond to those experiences the more those experiences come your way yes right okay yeah. i know i'm going to get some weird comments on this video that's fine but... I, i'm used to it i don't, I don't, I don't read comments anymore yeah <laughs> that's funny so uh, I think that's just about what I wanted to cover today. Is there something you'd like to share, something that's on your mind that you'd just like to share in general to backyard beekeepers and people that yeah. find yeah. themselves <laughs> looking at bees, but they're like, oh, I could never keep those. But well, I always like to just say, you know, take care of the bees. And this is, this is um, your job because they do provide you food. So mm -hmm. if, even if you have like an apartment, you know, you can have flowers outside or you can put out a little bowl with rocks for water so that they can drink in the hot, on the hot days. You know, people mm -hmm. forget that these need water too. Um, just so simple things like that. Plant mm -hmm. lots of flowers. Plant mm -hmm. Okay. Plant flowers. I changed my mind. This is not the end. Um, <laughs> You said that when you, you, you saw a fairy at 20, 21 years of age, what did it look like? Oh, the fairy? I love it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, she, she mooned me. I saw her <laughs> little magenta butt flying in front of my face when I was camping in Sedona. And um, I, I was like, I saw her little legs and her little feet, and I went, Whoop! And because I was so surprised, I went, Whoop! and the, I've never done any drugs and I don't smoke and I don't drink. Um, so it wasn't like a hallucination or something. It was a fairy and she was like this big and her little butt 
and her little legs were, and her feet were sticking out. And then she flew away because I, I was so surprised. Mm -hmm. But she was right here. And that was a, a single event? Did that, yeah. did that, so it never happened again? No. So one time in your whole life. Have you tried to illustrate that or do a piece of art around that experience of any? No, because no? to me, it was just like normal. Like, yeah. it's like, let me just show you, you know, it was like a little present. Let me yeah. just show you. So to show you that that dimension is out there. Yeah. yeah. And there is a documentary uh, about fairies and they go all over Scotland and Ireland. And I don't I've know. I've never seen it, but it's, I want to see that one. You it's really need to see it because... Yeah. I recycle a lot of that information on my grandchildren because it's how I have grandsons and they're just inherently kind of borderline destructive when they get outside. Uh -huh. and, I, and I walk them over to all the heavily mossed and uh, areas where there's lots of ferns in the woods and uh, that's a fairy fort. You better watch it. If they, see, right. you, they see you damaging anything out here. Uh, but it was really funny because uh, there were these construction workers, I think it was in Ireland, and they were told they couldn't run a, a main route. They were changing the roads through, and uh, they're interviewing the, the chief engineer for the, the road construction. He had been told it's a ferry fort, and he can't run that through there. And uh, they were asking him, did he believe in ferries? He goes, no. He goes, but do you want to take a chance on disrupting a ferry fort? <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> He, it's not that he was on the edge enough that he really doesn't want to test it out. Right. But uh, it's a very, you should see that. It's a very interesting uh, documentary. I would love but, to. Uh, okay. Well, Sarah, I want to thank you so much for taking time to share with everybody today. I have, one, often... I have one more thing to add. Okay. Um, I'm just starting. It's probably not going to happen for a couple of weeks, but I'm going to be making a, an NFT collection. Uh using bee queen images and bee facts and like um, how to kind of uh, put that attribute to yourself. So I will put that link in, even though there aren't any images up yet. I just want people to know. I'm excited to um, kind of uh, educate people in that new digital realm. Okay. That's interesting. So we will, yeah. And the link will be there as you say, but there won't be any content yet. Right. Okay. But people will have that for later. Yeah. Is that it? Anything else? I think that's it for now. Thank you so much. It was, it was wonderful. I had really great time. to meet you virtually. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all yeah. that you perceive and the things that you do. I hope you, you have a great summer. Great. I hope you come to one of my bee dances. Okay. I'll let you know when it's happening. You never thank know. Thank you, Sarah. Hey, you never know. Thank yes. you so much. Have a great rest of your week. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. And that wraps up another interview. It was a pleasure to host Sarah and learn more about the healing power of honeybees. If you enjoyed this interview and would like to see more, please leave a like and I invite you to subscribe. Please visit the video description for links and more information. I'm Frederick Dunn, and I wish you all the best in beekeeping.